first book today is rather strange. It's called The Moldy. In the great garden of the world, there was peace before Moldy came. He came from the wilderness in the night, under the ground, lifting the grass, plowing among the flowers. He shook the king's crystal palace. Along the street, he tumbled people from their beds. Talitha, the daughter of the king, said, the daffodil school has fallen down. We heard a monster growling in the earth, cried an old root wife. It snapped its teeth. There, there, an old hedgehog said, a royal nanny. Hear the worst, said the king. Moldy intends to spoil the great garden and leave it lost and wild. He sent soldiers of the thistle to drive Moldy to the wilderness again. The people waited. Root wives brewed a victory punch and made golden honey cakes. Children stitched tapestry with patterns of the winners marching home. No one came. The punch grew sour, honey cake turned black, tapestry unraveled on the floor. Talitha caught a beetle by his black back leg to ask what gossip came from underground. Moldy's underground, said the beetle, and I'm off to the wilderness. Now he's here, it's safer there. Talitha sat with a passing slug and spoke to her. He has a pantry full of soldiers, said the slug. People like him never have enough. And I'm tasty, but not hasty, so I'm off. Talitha came to the daffodil school and the hole in the ground. She knew what to do. She went down the hole and walked along the shadows. She shouted, Moldy, Moldy, come here. Go home, said a tiny root child in the tunnel wall. Far away, she heard the soft, gigantic tread of Moldy, walking his tunnel. She heard him sniff and grunt. I'll fight to get our soldiers back, she said. You fight, said Moldy. I'll bite, and snapped his teeth. They sounded large. Excuse me, said Talitha, and punched him on the nose. That's nice, said Moldy. That's friendly. Rub my nose again, good and hard. I won't tickle, said Talitha. And taking out her embroidery, she stuck the cruel needle in. Sensational, said Moldy. The others ran away, but you have been most welcoming. I think I've won, said Talitha. Give back all the soldiers of the thistle in your pantry. I'll do anything you say, said Moldy. And leave the garden of the world, said Talitha. I'd go anywhere you want, said Moldy. You'll marry me, of course. I suppose I must, said Talitha. They set the soldiers of the thistle free and marched with them to the Crystal Palace. I'm not losing a daughter, said the king, but gaining a Moldy. He ordered the children of the Daffodil School to be bridesmaids and pages, and dropped a dewy tear. Hedgehog, dear, said Talitha. Scratch him while I put on my wedding dress. Of course, there, there, said the hedgehog, and she leaned on Moldy with her spiny side. Oh, said Moldy. Oh, you make a fellow happy. I think I'd rather marry you. There, there, said the hedgehog brushing him so hard his hair stood on end. Talitha came back in her wedding dress of fallen petals. I hope you will not be upset, the hedgehog said. He has changed his mind. It's easy work for me to keep him comfy, and I think I'll make a better bride. Moldy has no manners, said the king, but I am rather pleased. They can have the royal wedding. And so they did. After it, there was a long procession to the far wilderness. There, by dusky candlelight, Talitha kissed the bride goodbye and waved her out of sight. In the end, Talitha married a fritillary prince. And always there is work to do in the great garden of the world. The 
Animal, The Vegetable, and John D. Jones. Book number two. It's about two sisters, the animal and the vegetable, according to John D. Jones, who may become their stepbrother. They're on a tryout holiday by the sea in America. They're Americans. And none of them like each other very much until this particular day when something happens to Clara. The sun was warm on her back. The water that lapped over the sides of the float was cool on her stomach. Clara wondered idly what John Dee's book was about. She knew he was writing one because she had seen chapter two at the top of the page, and then the words, how to. Probably how to bring misery and discomfort to those around you, she decided. 20 ways to make people feel awful, with a special pictorial section on insulting looks. Deanie was doing something strange, turning around and around like a hunk of barbecued meat. Cold fear gripped Clara. The faint gray line of the shore on the horizon told her how far away she had drifted. Clara had been clinging to the float for two hours. Occasionally, when it made a particularly wrenching move, she would moan. She felt as if she had been drawn far away from the normal world, into one of those spots that sailors fear, marked on old maps by drawings of dragons and reptiles. She had no idea how long she had been on the raft. All her life, it seemed. The part of her life spent on dry land, walking, sleeping, eating, doing normal things, seemed like a brief, vague dream. This was hard, cold reality. Touching the sides of the float with both hands, legs shaking, knees knocking, waiting tensely for the next wave that could throw her again into the sea. This time, she said through her clenched teeth, this time I won't let go. Well, whether she did or not, you can find out for yourself if you read this book to the end. A life on the ocean waves. Not the American coastline where Clara was washed out to sea, but Sydney Harbour in Australia. A beautiful, exciting place. Most of Sydney is very modern, but there's an old part called the Rocks which hasn't been rebuilt with skyscrapers. It still has narrow streets and terraced houses, just like a hundred years ago. And that's the setting for this story, a ghost story about a girl called Abigail Kirk who goes back into the past. She's 14 and she often has to look after Natalie, a neighbor's four-year-old. One day they go for a walk and they see some other children in the playground. Now what's the matter, Dopey? They're playing Beady Bow and it scares me. But I like to watch. Please, let's watch. Abigail held her close to keep her out of the wind. The child was shivering. Yet the game didn't look so exciting. Just one more goofy kid's game. First of all, the children formed a circle. In the middle was a girl who had been chosen by some counting out rhyme. That's mother, explained Natalie. What's mother? You know, a mummy, like my mummy. Oh, mother. Yes, but she's called mother. That's in the game. 
Someone hidden behind the concrete pipes made a scraping sound. The children chorused, Oh, mother, what's that? Nothing at all, chanted the girl in the centre. The dog at the door, the dog at the door. Now a blood-curdling moan was heard from behind the pipes. Oh, mother, what's that? What can it be? The wind in the chimney, that's all, that's all. There was a clatter of stones being dropped. Some of the younger children squawked and were hushed. Oh, mother, what's that? What's that? Can you see? It's the cow in the barn, the horse in the stall. At this point, mother pointed beyond the circle of children. A girl covered in a white sheet was creeping towards them, waving her arms and wailing. It's Petey Bow, shrieked Mother in a voice of horror, risen from the dead. At this, the circle broke and the children ran shrieking to fling themselves in a huddle of arms and legs in the sandpit at the other end of the playground. What on earth was all that about? asked Abigail. She felt cold and grumpy. The person who is Beady Bow is a ghost, you see, explained Natalie. And she rises from her grave, and everyone runs and pretends to be afraid. If she catches someone, that someone has to be the next Beady Bow. But the little furry girl doesn't get scared. I think she'd like to join in. Look, Abigail, see her watching over there. Abigail looks up and sees a strange little girl with close cropped hair and ragged clothes watching them. Later, she sees her again. She chases her up a steep alley, which leads into a queer old road. Abigail couldn't remember ever walking up it before, though it was directly opposite the playground. The little furry girl had flickered out of the light, but Abigail could see her bare feet and the edge of her skirt. She called out teasingly, I can see you hiding there. And then, before she could make another move, she heard a clinking and a creaking and rattling and the unmistakable sound of horses' hooves. And out of the gathering dusk came a high, old-fashioned cab, glittering black in the wavering light from the street lamp. Playing Beatty Bow. That's what it's called. And believe me, it's a fair thing can read, sport which proves that lots of good things come out of Australia, apart from our cuddly chums, the koala bears. This book is an animal alphabet, which means there's a beautifully illustrated animal to go with each letter of the alphabet. A for armadillo, B for bat, C for cat, I mean chameleon, D for What's that upside down? Dodo. D for dead. E for, you've guessed it, an animal for each letter of the alphabet. Some of them, of course, you might not know, but don't worry, all the answers are at the back of the book. Well, that brings us sadly to the last, the very last and final episode of Star Stormers. <laughs> Four space travelers and their parents are in the clutches of the Octopus Emperor. But once again, Ispex pits his wits against the forces of evil. Come closer. I am the Octopus Emperor. Terribly frightening, I must seem to you. Don't be frightened. My empire is only black dust. He's lying. Each speck of dust does have a kind of intelligence. And the specks even act together. But what does that amount to? Dust. Obedient duck. Confusion! Is my 
Spotify controls everything. Everything must happen at once. Then he can't concentrate. Go and tell your parents. <coughs> Which way? Mom! Dad! <coughs> of Star Stormers, read books two, three, four, and five! Well, now it's time to meet our last author, the man who in fact wrote Star Stormers along with many other books, Nicholas Fisk. And sadly, for the last time, it's question time. Do you think that the life you described in Star Storms will ever come true in the future? Yes, I don't see why not. I don't see why all sorts of things shouldn't come true right now. I don't see why a spaceship shouldn't land out there, for instance. We're sending out signals all the time to the whole universe, aren't we? We're always on radio, television. We're always trying to get an answer from something. So nothing would surprise me in your future. Have you always been a writer? Yeah, since I was about your age. And when I got a typewriter, I was 12. By the time I was 14 or 15, I was selling stuff from school to newspapers and magazines. They didn't know it was a schoolboy, did they? They got it typed, so it was all right. That's what I've always written. Did you like science fiction when you were young? Oh, yes. I've always been stuck on science fiction. It's the one thing that fascinates me. I, do, I like yesterday. I like it very much. I'd like to know all about Lord Nelson or something like that. Today is fine, but tomorrow I can make the rules. I can say whatever I like. You're all green, you walk on your hands, that's fine. You've got to believe me because it's in tomorrow and you can't prove me wrong. How did you choose the title for Grinny? Well, it was thrust on me, really. I heard an old lady who was very pleased with herself saying, oh, the, all the children flock around me, I'm never lonely. They don't call me their granny, they call me their Grinny granny. It must be my little smile. I thought, that's sinister. That's really sinister. You could have a marvellous old, old, dear old lady who isn't dear and who isn't old, who isn't a lady, and she's always grinning. So I wrote the book. It started from that. Have you ever thought about writing a book on nuclear war? No, I don't want to, because it would end pretty badly, wouldn't it? I don't mind writing a book about what happens when there's been a nuclear war, and we've all survived it and everything's doing fine again. Or perhaps it's not doing fine. Perhaps we can only live on a bit of the planet. But I wouldn't like to do a book about the war itself. And it's being done a lot now anyhow. There are all sorts of programs about what it's like. I don't want to do that. Is your proper name Nicholas Fisk? No, that's just a, that's just a book name. I've had several others too. Well, what is your real name? Oh, I keep that secret. This is secret. I like being Nicholas Fisk the man who writes science fiction books for people like you. I don't want to be anybody else. John Lloyd from Merseyside has chosen the last book for this series. It's called... The Weird Stone of Braz Ingerman by Alan Garner. Strange names, ancient legends, the forces of good and evil, ordinary people, not what they seem. Were you ever frightened at all by this book? Not really. It's not really that frightening, except in the middle, but not a lot. Do you think witches and wizards and goblins could exist today? I don't think so. I think so in people's minds. Well, tell me one good reason why anyone else should read this book. Well, after you've read the legends and have 
first few pages. Just can't put it down. It's full of magic and mystery. This is true. Can't put it down. Listen to this bit. They were within a hundred yards of the farm when a car overtook them and pulled up sharply. The driver, a powerfully built woman, got out and stood waiting. Is this the road to Macclesfield? She said when the children came up to her. I'm afraid I don't know, said Colin. We've only just come to stay here. Oh, then you'll want a lift. Jump in the back. Thanks, said Colin, but it's only a few yards. Get in. But we... The woman's eyes glinted and the colour rose in her cheeks. You will get into the back. Honestly, it's not worth the bother. We'd only hold you up. The woman drew breath through her teeth. Her eyes rolled upwards and the lids came down until only an unpleasant white line showed. And then she began to whisper to herself. Ah, The Weird Stone of Brisingerman by Alan Garner. We had Star Stormers by Nicholas Fisk. There's a new set just been published. Animal Alphabet by Bert Kitchen. Playing Beatty Bow, an award-winning ghost story from Australia by Ruth Park. The Animal, the Vegetable, and John D. Jones from America by Betsy Byers. And The Mouldy by William Main with paintings by Nicola Bailey. Time to go. But between now and the book tower next year, keep reading. Remember, reading makes you grow. Come on, book tower watchers. Thank you.